Thank you, Councillor. Didn't mean to leave you hanging. I completely misunderstood the stuff. <laughs> All right, well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, Heritage Day 2023 here at Athel Baptist Church. Um, as you can see, uh, I'm your Scottish preacher today. Oh, thank you, sir. All right, so unfortunately, uh, something came out. Pastor Chris wasn't able to bring the message today, so I had the opportunity to step up. Uh, so I thought I was a good time to plug one of my babies, which is Heritage Day here at Athel Baptist Church. So I want to take a moment to kind of explain why, as a pastoral staff, we have adopted uh, this new tradition here at Athel Baptist. Now, one of the things that we thought about is we are living in a world that wants to resegregate. I mean, our nation fought so hard and our nation over history has shown that we can rise above the mistakes of our ancestors. But yet we are now in this era where we're trying to resegregate. So we thought it'd be a good idea to say, no, we need to be proud of who it is that God made us. None of us, no matter who you are, can change the culture or the ethnicity you came from. It's not possible. You can claim whatever you want to. You can identify however you like but you cannot change how you, are, how you were born. Myself, uh, my mother's dad was a McCurry, and it was a very small clan in Scotland way back when, so it was actually part of a bigger, what they call super clan, McPherson, because there's no fear in McPherson, and this is our tartan. This is the McPherson tartan. I'm very proud of my heritage, very proud of my opa, we call him, because he married a German lady when he was over in Europe during World War II, and my opa was just he was such an inspiration in my life. Stood about 5'2", probably, I think. <laughs> but um, just a sawmill worker, but loved the Lord with all his heart. And was never ashamed about it and was very powerful in his love of the gospel and preaching. And I want to carry on the heritage that I got from my opa when I was a young boy. <clears throat> so that's what one of the reasons why we, we chose to implement Heritage Day here at Athel Baptist. Now, the second reason is, as growing up Southern Baptist, I miss potlucks. <laughs> Those of you that have never been to church in the South don't understand that potlucks are a guaranteed aspect of going to church. We don't have enough of those here. I miss finishing church, going to have some fried chicken. We don't have that up here. So, you know, Pastor Chris also grew up Southern Baptist, so we're like, you know what, it'd be a great idea. Let's bring back some good fellowship, some good food. All right. So, again, like uh, Deacon Lucas said, if you didn't sign up, no big deal. Go home, cook something up, go grab Super One, show up. You don't need a special ethnic garb or anything. You just come for some fellowship and food. Now, the final reason we kind of thought about doing it is that we want to provide our youth an example. One of the things that I'm very passionate about, I'm very hopeful for, is that my kids when they leave this land, that they know they can go to a church to find fellowship and fun. I don't want my kids to go off to a strange land and think the only place to go find fun is a bar at midnight. Nothing good happens after midnight. I can tell you from being a police officer. Nothing good happens after midnight outside of your own home. Now, <laughs> oh, we're recorded on this one too, aren't we? I'm not. Uh, I'm going to get earful on that one. Um, anyway, so I want my children to leave this land and understand I can go, the church is the place I need to go to find fellowship and fun. And we want our kids, again, to be proud of their heritage, to not be ashamed of whatever they are, Hispanic, African, Irish, Scottish, German, Scandinavian, Russian, whatever. To be proud of the fact that God made you an individually unique person. And not just be proud of your cultural heritage, be proud of your Christian heritage. That's what we're kind of going to anchor on today. And then kind of the, the final thing about it, teach our youth, you can make your own traditions. If you've been around my family at all, you know we have some, I just come up with some of the most harebrained ideas. Just my wife, God love her, she just is so faithful. <laughs> and just puts up with some of the nonsense. In fact, this past Valentine, I came up with this idea. I'm like, I got a great idea, love. What we're gonna do is 
We're going to make our children tell us what they, what qualities they're going to look for in their future wife and husband. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was so much fun. You know, uh, it was awkward for the kids, but Leslie and I had a great time. So my point just being, you're not bound to celebrate traditions that the world puts upon you. You can make your own traditions. The Bible's clear about that. Some revere other days more than this, the new moon, et cetera, et cetera. The point is, you can find ways to celebrate, make your own traditions within your family, within our church to celebrate God and who we are. So that is why here at Athel Baptist, we've chosen to go with Heritage Day. Now specifically, for today, if I can get this to work. Is the voice work now? <laughs> uh, clicker's not working. Oh! oh. There we go. So today we're talking about celebrating our Christian heritage. That is what I want us to anchor on today. Uh, we're going to start out. The passage is going to help us learn this. It's going to be found in Hebrews, the 12th chapter. If you're new to the Bible, if you go to the very end of the Bible, start moving yourself forward, past Revelations, past Peter, past James, you'll find the book of Hebrews. Now, the passage I'm going to read from is going to be found in the 12th chapter. I did... I am usually, I usually try to do a very good job and make it very big so you can read. I did not do this uh, today. I apologize. But this will be on our website and everything if you want to go read it later. And you can always, it's not cheating to look at your neighbor's Bible, by the way. <clears throat> so I'll begin here in the 12th chapter. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has set down the right hand of the throne of God. Hallelujah. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. You know, that's just funny, the word scourges. I don't have a very good idea, like, exactly what the original authors meant by that, but it doesn't seem pleasant. Um... Picking back up, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So there's just, there's so much richness in this passage, we're not going to be able to mine all of it. I'm going to try to take some highlights, some wave tops to kind of help us to really walk away celebrating our Christian heritage. Now, the first aspect, if we anchor on the word celebrate, is we need to revere our legacy. We need to revere our legacy. Now, the 12th chapter of Hebrews is only understood in light of the context of the previous chapter, which is chapter 11. If you're familiar with chapter 11, it's also colloquially known as the Heroes of the Faith chapter. It's a chapter that lists, and we're going to go through this here in a second, kind of the heroes of the faith, those who were faithful in the eyes of God. Here it starts off, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Now faith is reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen, for by this our ancestors were approved. Now here specifically, if we, if we look into it, the 11th chapter, so who's in it? Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Moses, 
And then I always, I found it interesting, it just kind of ends out the prophets. So what about the prophets? Well, let's, read, let's look at the, what the prophets went through. You see here, they quenched the mouths of lion. They escaped the edge of the sword, valiant in battle. All right? They did not accept deliverance. They might obtain a better resurrection. Mocking, scourging, chains. One guy was sawn in two. Tempted, slain with a sword, wandered about in sheepskins, goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented of whom the world was not worthy. Let that sink in. Of whom the world was not worthy. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise God had provided something better for us, that they should be made per not be made perfect apart from us. Now there's a couple gems I want to take out of this passage that aren't going to go in stream with my overall uh, purpose, but I, I just don't want to miss them. I want to provide things for you to go through and dig through on your own time, your own self-study. The first of these is when you have an Elijah moment, those moments, and I'll go back into this, where you're just, woe is me. You need to think about this. I know me personally, I'm truly humbled all the times when I hear about things that other Christians have gone through, other martyrs have gone through, and I'm really convicted in my own life when I complain. I know um, Craig may be on the same page with me on this one, but I know when I was in the Marine Corps, when I do any training, you know, I was an aviation guy, so I kind of wasn't a big fan of the mud. But when we had to do training in the mud, I used to just be kind of a sore sally about it, I'll be honest. I wasn't real, you know, wasn't my cup of tea. And I used to think about the men who went through Korea, and I used to be so humble to think, man, those were men, because what they went through with the lack of equipment they had and just sheer grit, it was not just humbling, but it was also inspiring because I was carrying on that legacy. We have that same opportunity to not anchor in self-pity and doubt, but let's honor our legacy. Let's step up to the plate. Now, the second gem I want to pull out of this passage, the world was unworthy. Realize that if you walk the faith and you go out preaching the word, you proclaim, defend the truth, this world will attack you. It's like if, if, if you like to watch comedy, one of the stupidest things people on, the com on a comedy show will do is try to heckle the comedian. Like, honestly, who is the idiot who's out there in, this, in like, the audience says, I'm going to show this comedian, right? He'll shout out something, then what happens? The comedian just eviscerates him in front of everybody, Right? That is how Christianity is in this modern world. Everything that hates Christianity has the microphone. They have the media outlet. They have all the publicity. So do not expect, if you decide to walk in faith and proclaim the truth of God, do not expect that you're going to be treated kindly by this world. That's just not how it works. And the other thing is they did not receive the promise. This is we're obviously not a name and acclaim at church. We don't promote anything that, that does that. But you can guarantee there are some blessings that you will not, will not receive in this life. So don't judge God's approval by, through some of the tribulations and chastenings you're going through currently. Something greater waits on the other side. All right, now I want to get back to it. So what were they witnesses to? And this is the important part. They were witnesses to that God is always faithful. This is one of the most common themes of the Bible. No matter what man does, God is always faithful. I like to look at the Bible from a dispensational viewpoint. What does that mean? It's a fancy word. All it means is I take the Bible literally, unless there's some kind of figurative or contextual reason why not to take it loose? I believe the world was created in seven days. I believe in grace. I believe Christ will reign a thousand years. I believe Jonah will swallow by well, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because that's what the Bible says. There's nothing in the context or figurative language that leads me to believe that it shouldn't be taken that way. As such, you look at, there's different epochs of time where God has interacted with man in a different way. Salvation has always been based on Christ, either looking forward to Christ or looking back to Christ. But yet we cannot disagree with the fact that when Adam was in the garden, purely innocent, and walked with God, is a completely different relationship that we have with God right now in the age of the church age, where we are about being laborers, spreading his gospel. It's complete. It's different. 
Salvation is the same, but the way that God has interacted with man is different. I don't want to turn this into a theological debate. The point I want to drive home is this, that through every epoch of time, no matter how God has interacted with man, he's always been faithful to provide light. If mankind will respond to the light that is given, he will bring them to salvation. It's that simple. God is always faithful regardless of how we are. Now, and this is a theme. You see here, God is always faithful by whom you are called to the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 1, 9. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself, 2 Timothy 2, 13. He will cover you with his pinions, which is a part of a bird's wing, and under his wings you may take refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a wall, Psalm 91, 4. Rest in the fact that God is always faithful. Now, I don't know about you, when I read this here was the faith, I don't look at my life and say, oh, yeah, I definitely fit about in between verse 7 and 8. That's where I would go, right? <laughs> I mean, I can be a bit of a pessimist at times, a realist, I like to say, but I tend to remember my failures very well. I don't really remember my victories that well. But I can't forget my failures. It's just how I am as a person. And when I read this, I'm always humble because I don't, personally speaking, I look back and I say, man, I, I failed here, I messed up here, I missed this point here, and I just, I, I just can't see myself rating inclusion into something so majestic. But the key here is it's not about my approval. I'm not approved because of anything I've done or ever will do. I'm approved because that says here in Hebrews 10, 14, for by one offering, he is perfected forever those who are being sanctified. We are approved through Christ. I mean, Sean's band, they sang Amazing Grace today. That is why it is amazing because there's nothing we can do, ever will do, that will ever result in salvation. And if we simply accept his grace, not only are we forever justified, we amazingly are given the righteousness of Christ. It makes no sense whatsoever. And speaking of nonsensical ideologies, that is why if you interact with a Latter-day Saint, you need to challenge them. Because their whole stance is the restoration of the gospel. Explain to me how you can restore what a perfect God has done once and for all for everyone. The very nature of the gospel is is totally detached from how it's received, how the church acts, etc. You cannot restore what has been perfectly done. So when you interact with the Latter-day Saint, this is the seed that you need to plant and drive home. I, I really believe that that is a seed that if they will, will nourish it and water it, it will come to fruition one day when they recognize the fact that you cannot improve on what God has perfectly done, which is the gospel. Now, moving on. In celebrating our Christian heritage, Christian. Unfortunately, in our day and age, Christian has become a word like love, hero, um, tolerance, all these words that have completely lost their meaning because it's just thrown around with no boundaries with its use. If you're going to claim the title Christian, you need to run your race. The Lord says, why do you call me Lord and not do what I command you to do? Here in Hebrews 12, 1, we're turning back. Let us lay aside every weight, the sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now, the Apostle Paul chooses to use uh, the metaphor of a race to kind of talk about how life should be for the Christian. So I'm going to kind of really weigh in on this. Now, I think the first aspect of life being a race is that you need to let go of those things that weigh us down. Last night I was in preparation for this. I, I wanted to see, hey, what's the fastest world record time for 1,500 meters? You know, 
So 1,500 meters, if you're not familiar, if you're not a track kind of person, that's nine-tenths of a mile. How fast do you think a, a human can run nine-tenths of a mile? Somebody throw a guess out. 328. Nice guess. Three minutes and 20, yeah, three minutes and 28 seconds. Nine-tenths of a mile. I mean, let me put that in perspective. A 100-meter dash, right, the world record, I think, is 11 seconds, something like that. They're running 14 second 100 meters for 15 of those. That's 15 miles an hour. I, I, can't, I don't, I mean, it's hard for me to do that on a bike. <laughs> so we watch this and these, these guys are just, just hauling, just smoking. Now imagine, and the funny thing was, we watched it, uh, Aiden and Leslie and I watched it because Leslie used to do track um, in her day and and it was, the, I think, the Tokyo 2020 Olympics, and they showed, and all the different runners got up there, and, like, the guy from Poland was, like, yeah, doing a cool sign, and they were all, like, doing, like, you know, like, I don't know, they're just having a fashion show before they run. It was kind of funny. <laughs> now, imagine they did that, right? They're, they're lining up. They're about to race for the Olympic gold medal. They come to the last guy, and he's wearing a kilt. He's wearing a helmet. He's wearing work boots, right? And he grabs a couple boat anchors just for good measure, and he like walks up to the line, right? Would that make any sense? Absolutely not. But yet that is what Paul is admonishing us for. If you're gonna claim the title Christian, you should be running your race. But yet we all, we all, myself included, are guilty of doing all these things that weigh us down, that distract us from God. We have used our Christian liberty to go flirt with sin in some way. Every one of us is guilty of it. And so, I mean, I'm not going to sit up here and list all the categories that, that could involve. You know what they are in your life. And you know what you need to cut out that distracts you and prevents you from doing what God has called you to do. So the first thing we need to do to run our race is we need to trim down. Get rid of all that stuff that is keeping us from doing what God has called us to do. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. The second aspect is, you've heard it said that life is a marathon, not a sprint. I would like to say, I, my caveat would be that I think life is more of an adventure race. Now, I don't know any of you that have fought an adventure race. When I was in high school, it kind of became a big craze, and I was like, yeah, this is so cool. Um, I tried one when I was at Academy. We totally didn't make it. We just got crushed. Because um, adventure races, they sound fun. Kind of like Leslie had a comedy skit about cross-country running. It sounds fun, like you're going somewhere, but you're just in a park running, right? Adventure race sounds like adventure. No, you're actually just not sleeping and, like, just moving until, like, you can, you're at a walking pace. Literally, you have no energy but to literally just shuffle along like a zombie, right? That's more what life is like. We're just all trying to survive, it feels like, most times in our life. But you need to commit to the finish. Commit to the finish. See it through. And you establish this just like David, right, before he defeated Goliath, before he stood up to this mountain of a man, stunned him with a stone and cut his head off. Right, what had he done prior to that? He'd slain the lion and the bear. God had prepared him for that moment. If you want to commit to finish your life well, running your race for God, you commit to things that he has called you to commit to. Church, your marriage, right? That's an easy thing, right? Marriage? I mean, it's easy for my wife, because, you know. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> she has it rough, I promise you. Thank you, Rod, for the water. <clears throat> you got to be committed. Commit to those things. And also, don't make the mistake of comparing yourself to others. We're not all called to the same race. I mean, I won't lie. Sean, I bet I, I'll put money cash on a barrel head that we can go grab a couple of spoons out of the kitchen 
and get a gazoo out of a Cracker Jack, and Sean could come up here and play some wonderful melody. Uh, uh, cash on the barrel head. Anybody wants to take that bet? You could give me the finest, is it Stratocaster? I don't remember what it is in Wayne's World. Is that what it is? <laughs> it's that. You give me the finest Stratocaster the world has ever seen. Ain't nothing but cacophony, cacophony coming out of that. Right? I am not called to make beautiful music for the Lord. He didn't give me rhythm. He didn't give me an ear. All right? There's a whole list, laundry list of things I can tell you about. And if I try to force that square in that circle, it's not going to work. I was not called to that race. So do not make the mistake of looking at what others are doing for Christ. That is the whole power of 1 Corinthians 12, is we must come together as a body. We all have different things to do. Don't ever feel that your job here at the church or what service you do for the church is insignificant. If you do, please let somebody know. We are such a volunteer-powered church, and every one of you who serves here is so valuable to what we do in ministry. Just because you're not up here piping off, because Christ is clear about what? Who's going to be the greatest in heaven? The least. Why? Because I am under very strict judgment from being a teacher. Terrifies me all the time. I have been getting talents that demand that I go do things. Maybe great things, right? We have not been given the same amount of talent, faith, etc. But do what you have been called to do. Run your race. Now another aspect, you see here, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Trust in your training. We talked about David, how he slayed the lion and the bear. He was willing to stand before Goliath. Now, those of you that have done any kind of like competitive athletics, you know, I think wrestling is a great one. You know, my son does wrestling. And, you know, I've done jujitsu, so I have a little bit of understanding. There's a point in there when you're exerting yourself fully, you've got to make a decision. Am I going to continue to give 100% or, or do I need to back out, right? It, it's not a, there's no flashing neon signs telling you what to do, right? At some point, you've got to trust the training that you've done to go for that move or to give all you've got or, or to exert fully. Trust in Christ. When you're called to do something, man, I just really feel that I need to go help the nursery. <laughs> But I don't know how I can survive those little tyrants. I don't have the strength or the patience. Trust. Trust. I've said it before. I really think we make errors in Christian faith by like, I don't feel called to do this. I don't feel it. I don't feel like if there's a door open, there's an opportunity that you are capable to do that is a calling. Because here's one thing we forget. Service is subjective, not objective. What in the world does that mean? This is what I mean. Service is not defined by the object you do, but by who receives it. I'll give you an example. If this church needs someone to water the grass and do all that kind of stuff, it doesn't matter if you like it or don't like it, whatever. That is a service for you to do it. It is the subject that is receiving it. If it doesn't need the grass water, you're not doing it. It's not service because it's not needed. Does that make sense? So service is subjective. It doesn't matter how you feel about it. Service is who receives it, whether it's a service to them or not. Trust that when God opens an opportunity that you can serve his church, that he will empower you, equip you to do it. And it'll probably build your character. Build character, that's one of my kids' favorite things. I'm saying, oh, dad's gonna talk about character. Um, 
The final point here, for consider him who endures such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Now in the Marine Corps, uh, we had this phrase, we'd say, don't go internal. <laughs> uh, so what does that mean? It's kind of like I mentioned the Elijah moment earlier, and I want to get into that. In the Marine Corps, when you use that context, it was like, don't start becoming this person who goes internal, like, I'm so cold, and I just ate my life, and I'm hungry, and you just, you become useless because you're just internal whining. This is what Christ is talking about. This is what Paul is admonishing us for. Do not become this individual who's just looking at your situation, looking at your chasing, looking at your hardship, and saying, woe is me. I call it an Elijah moment. Here's why I call it an Elijah moment. Elijah, love the prophet. Don't get me wrong. I have so much respect for Elijah. In fact, 1 Kings 18 is one of my favorite chapters in the book of the Bible, right? If you're not familiar, it's when he goes to King Ahab and Jezebel, the two probably the most wicked king and queen of Israel. It says, get your prophets, meet you on the mountain. 450 prophets of Baal go to the mountain. They say, we're going to see whose Lord is, whose God is real. They set up two altars. The 450 prophets of Baal, like, dance around, cut themselves, yell, do all this crazy stuff, I think, pretty much most of the day. Nothing happens to their offering. Right? What does Elijah do? Elijah comes there, pours water on his offering until it's like the moat around it is just overflowing. Does a prayer. Lord licks everything clean with just the flames from heaven. And then they slay the 450 prophets of Baal. I mean, what a powerful experience to go through. But yet the next passage, chapter in the Bible says that Jezebel threatened him through the power of her false gods and he was terrified. Like, how do you go from doing something so incredible and amazing to the very next moment being absolutely terrified because someone swears by their false gods that they're going to kill you? So he flees. Angel comes, gives them two meals, and on the power of those meals, he wanders for uh, 40 days to Mount Horeb, I believe. 1 Kings 19, check me when you do your self-study. So he comes there. Now think about this. He has just done this amazing show of God's force. He's given two meals, sustains for 40 days, gets to the mountain, and what does he do? Starts whining, woe is me, I'm the only one, I cannot believe no one else is out there doing this. Right? Then God comes in the earthquake, the thunder, and in a still small voice, he says, I have kept back 7,000 people who haven't bent the knee. Now, in my humble opinion, opinion, I'm going to stress that, I don't think it's coincidental that shortly after this, Elijah was replaced by Elijah. My opinion. Point being, don't let yourself start going internal, having Elijah moments. God is building your character. Run your race. Races are supposed to not be fun. Right? When we watch these dudes who, like, literally all they do is run three and a half minutes and 1,500 meters, none of them finish it like, who let's do a little jig, right? I mean, they're all like, uh, uh, you know? I mean, races are supposed to suck. If you've ever done a race, it is not pleasant if you're racing. Now, if you're out, like, getting to know people and just buy, you know, have an experience, and that's, a, that's not a race, one. But if you're racing, it is going to be painful. It's going to be miserable, All right? So get after it. Accept that part of life. All right, now, final point I want to talk about heritage. We need to reinvest in others. Now, I chose reinvest, not invest, because this should be a constant recurring theme. You shouldn't just invest and leave it to grow. No, you invest, 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 invest. As a Christian, you want to have a heritage, and to have a heritage, you must continue to invest. Anybody with children know exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, the other day, I can't remember what came up, and 
<laughs> you know, my 13-year-old and I, and I was saying something, and I'm like, oh, anything I can shoehorn talking about uh, waiting for marriage, man, I'm on it like a dog on a bone. And my oldest son's like, oh, God, yes, I know. STDs, yes, I know. <laughs> Children, you know, right? But I'm like, hey, it ain't going to stop. I'm going to keep. Because as my point is, as a parent, if you could just tell your children one time and that's all it took, right, it'd be easy. Right? You have to continually tell your kids, clean your room, make your bed, brush your teeth. Don't slap each other. In today's passage, we read as a, as a church family, like arrows in the hands of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Now, one of the things I think is missed in this is that one of the most powerful weapons is an arrow. Think about one of the most powerful dynasties of all time, the Mongols. What made the Mongols amazing? Was they invented the recurved bow that allowed them to launch arrows. They weren't like samurai. They weren't Spartans. They rode a horse very fast and shot you while you were 40 yards away. And they decimated, conquered. Uh, they're one of the largest empires to have ever existed off the power of an arrow. The point in this passage is you can derive so much power through your heritage, vice yourself. You know, that doesn't make sense, Pastor, really. It's what Christ did. Christ said, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. He follows it up. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Christ himself is testifying to the fact that some of the greatest works you can do, the most power you can do, is through your heritage. It's very humbling, right? To know that you may just be a conduit for somebody else to do something great. I mean, that is one of the things uh, that led me to my job transition, was to like, man, I got to recognize that my, my time is probably past. <laughs> I need to stop pursuing and do something that's going to prepare my kids better. Very humbling for me. Almost as humbling as when my oldest child finally started skiing faster than me. <laughs> I can still beat them all in jujitsu, though. I have the crown. That's right. For now. For now. Yes, that is very true. For now. <laughs> oh. All right, I want to get into, before the eye of Sauron really starts burning at me here. Those of you who are new here don't know what the eye of Sauron is. It's that big red clock that just yells at me the whole time. All right, as a pastor, I need to leave you with some application. I don't want to just have you walk away feeling good or entertained. or I want you to walk away with something to do. First thing, study the Bible. Notice I didn't say read the Bible. Why do I am I saying study the Bible? This is why. One, I think that sometimes we misunderstand when we tell people to read the Bible that we're asking you to just do an exercise. I think one of the, the most detrimental things we have is the read the Bible in a year thing. You should not read more Bible than you digest. If you're reading a verse a day, so be it. Meditate upon that verse and empower that verse in your life. Now, don't be immature and just settle for a verse a day. Strive to fill your life to constantly have your mind on the law and the grace. But live a life where you study the Bible. Because when you study the Bible, you can go back to our heritage and you can be inspired 
by what others have done before us. And God will speak to you by what is happening in the Bible. He will speak to your life situation through prayer and your study of the Bible. And if you don't believe that, talk to, don't take my word for it. One, do it and experience it. Two, talk to a person you consider a mentor who is a disciple, who is an avid studier of the Bible. And I guarantee you, they will tell you and explain to you how this very principle is shown to be true in their life where they're going through a difficult time or doing something, and when the Bible passage they're reading has spoke to them, the Holy Spirit has come to you to say, look, Abraham, I asked him to sacrifice his son, but I provided something better, I was testing him. Hey, in your life right now, I'm asking you to sacrifice this, but if you will trust me, I will provide you with something better. Now, that's just an example, but there are multiple ways God will speak to you. You know, this, I come to church, this person just annoys me, wears a kilt, he's loud, just, I just want to kick him in the face. Hey, you might come across Romans 12, 19, I'm probably wrong on that, but hey, live peaceably with all men. As much as it um, involves you, I, I kind of slaughtered that one, but the point is, we're all commanded to live peaceably. You can find it there in Romans 12. The Bible will speak to you if you will study it, if you will invest your time in it. I can't download it, I can't you're going to be anemic as a Christian if, the, if your intake of biblical knowledge is limited to, to what a pastor gives you. I don't care how good they are. You, you've got to do the work yourself. Study the Bible. Step out in faith. You know, I did a sermon series on this back in January. I'm still going through this myself. But put your faith into action. Trust Him. Again, if you're going to... Accept the title of a Christian, run the race. Don't walk it, run it. If you don't understand what that means, find a mentor and learn. Get after it. And if you're not, just don't call yourself a Christian. Go enjoy your life. I don't, I don't mean to be so blunt. I'm not trying to be a, a jerk about that statement. But I'm saying is, if you're going to do the title, Jesus says, why call me Lord if you're not going to do what I command you to do? Why? Why waste your time? You only live once. Go out and set it on fire. It's the second fire you might not like if you do that. The final application I want to give is stay in touch. It's so easy in this day and age to either completely get self-absorbed in the social media and this, this narcissistic world we live in. And the other side of the spectrum, it's easy to go completely Idaho and independence, right? I don't need... Your water, I don't need your electricity. I live out in the mountain, whatever. <clears throat> that is not what you're called to do as a Christian. You're called to stay connected. And I'll anchor on Pastor Ken's class. He's doing a spiritual gift class right now. What is the purpose of a spiritual gift? Is it for you? No. A <laughs> spiritual gift is given for you to provide the church. So if you're not connected to the church, like literally what good is is your gift, right? That's like being given an air compressor and going on a backpack camping trail. Like, what, what are you going to do with an air compressor? Like, go blow your buddies, wake them up. Like, like what are you going to do? We have all been given a spiritual gift, and if you don't know what your spiritual gift is, you can start out in the nursery. Hey, I'm not just saying that because nursery falls under my ministry, but I'm saying that will accelerate your desire to figure out what your spiritual gift is. <laughs> All right, as Sean and, and our lovely band come back up, I just want to end on this kind of uh, petition. Hey, ABC, you see our mission right there. Go reach Bill. Pastor Chris. Our sermon series, Let's Do Good Together for 2023. I just want to invite you to join us here at Athel Baptist. Help us leave a legacy. Yes, we are a bunch of crazy people who are wearing later hosen and a kilt. We are unique. But guess what? You can be unique with us. And I guarantee you, if you're here today, 
we can use you. The Lord can use you. You can build the kingdom with us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Lord, I'm so thankful to be in a church family that just exhibits so much service and sacrifice. Lord, we are a church that thrives because of those individuals who give of themselves on such a routine basis. You know, as a pastor, I'm always concerned that there'll be someone out there who feels unappreciated or just may not be cognizant of the value of what they give this church. And Lord, if that's any individual that can hear my voice, I pray that you just convict them to come forward to one of the pastors, one of the deacons, and just say, I mean, I, I just don't feel appreciated. I don't feel that I matter. So Lord, we can correct that. Because Lord, we, we need our volunteers so much in this church. And I know we each get caught up so many times that we, we fail to appreciate and, and just fail to give the thanks that's deserved. And, and for that, as a pastor, I, I ask for forgiveness. And I just pray that you help show us how to let people know that they are part of this kingdom building, that, that by virtue of the fact that you've accepted your grace, they are worthy. And Lord, on this day where we celebrate our heritage, I pray that you strengthen us to go out in this world and not be ashamed of who you have made us each individually to be. You've made each of us unique. And I pray that we don't fall prey to the trap. That we should spend our life trying to improve and change all these flaws and things that we can't change. Lord, if we are who you made us to be, we can always develop our character, Lord, but we can't change who you made us to be. And I pray that we appreciate that and we celebrate that. Because when we celebrate the fact that we are the DNA that you gave us. We showcase that we trust you. We say, Lord, you know, I don't know why you didn't give me beautiful Fabio hair, but Lord, I'm thankful. I'm thankful that I am the man who came from my line. And I want to go out there and I want to proclaim and defend your truth. Thank you, Lord, for this church, and I pray that we can always make every one of this church feel welcome and loved. All these things are doing Jesus Christ's lovely name. Amen.